This is a presentation on the surface energy balance in the Bowen ratio. And here you see on the title screen some screenshots of a famous research paper written by Dr. Champ Tanner in uh, 1960. And uh, this is where the concept of the energy balance and how it could be used to estimate evapotranspiration or ET from crops really became popular. Very important paper, and uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more as we move along. So again, reminding us why this is important, the concept of an energy balance is used a lot in evapotranspiration formula and models. So again, when we use formulas like the ASCE standardized reference ET equation, which we're going to study a lot more in detail later, um, it relies on the energy balance concept. That is, the equations used to estimate ET from weather data rely on the surface energy balance idea. So that's why it's important that we, that we study this. Many of us have, are familiar with the idea of an energy balance, the conservation of energy. That is, that energy can't be created or destroyed, but just changes forms. Uh, here on the left, you see the idea of those of us uh, thinking about weight gain and weight loss, right? That's, a, that's an energy balance concept. We have energy come in in terms of food. We have energy go out in terms of exercise and metabolic processes. Uh, if the energy in is greater than the energy out, then we have a change in storage, okay? That same conservation of energy applies to the field or to vegetation or water or any system that, uh, in regard. And that would include, you know, we think of net radiation is mainly our energy into the system. Latent and sensible heat fluxes are ways that energy can leave the system. And then our change in storage is often soil heat storage, or what we call soil heat flux. So we'll revisit that idea later, but just this idea that the concept of an energy balance can be applied to almost any system. And, you know, another great example is a greenhouse, right? If we want to try to model or simulate how changing management in the greenhouse will affect things like temperature, air flows, uh, humidity levels in the greenhouse, we use energy balance concepts. Um, and you can see here, for example, if we added a tinting to the roof of the glass house or, or put a, a thin coat of, of white um, colored paint, which people often do in the summer, to reduce the energy inputs, how would that affect things? So again, we can use this energy balance concept over and over in all kinds of different applications. Uh, it's often connected to the mass balance as well. So just like we have an energy balance, right, we can often have a mass balance of a system. So uh, let's take, take water, for example, right? We're all used to the water balance equation, right? Where we've got these forms of water inputs into the system minus these outputs, then we have the change in storage. So in this uh, diagram, you see the author is depicting energy exchanges on the right-hand side and mass balance changes on the left-hand side in this case, carbon. So um, often you see energy balance concepts combined with uh, mass balance concepts, especially for carbon, water, and nitrogen. And water is a particularly important example because we know the evaporation of water consumes energy, right? So because of latent heat flux. So, so here's how Tanner and many others have defined the energy balance of a field. So if you look at this very top equation, you have net radiation, minus soil heat flux equals latent heat flux plus sensible heat flux. So basically, Rn minus G is the available energy that's moved into the system, and um, L, E, and H represent, often represent the way heat leaves the system. And Tanner drew this kind of famous diagram you see here on the right. This is in his 1960 paper. And he's showing all the different forms of energy moving in and out of the system, both vertically and horizontally. To do a true energy balance of a control volume, which is what you see there, representing both the soil and the canopy, you would have to consider energy moving vertically and energy moving horizontally. But we often, when we work with really large fields, right, we can ignore this horizontal transport of energy. So it, it's so small that it's, that it's negligible. And we can just 
collapse it down into only looking at vertical movement of energy, which you see here in figure B. And this is where we get this famous equation, Rn minus G equals Le plus H. So immediately this energy balance, surface energy balance that we'll call it, that we're using in this case, um, really only applies to, to large or real areas or, you know, fields, things like that, forests, large areas. And here again, you can see that we can rewrite the energy balance equation. See the, the one just below it there where we're showing Rn is the energy in, H and Le is the energy out, and then soil heat storage or soil heat flux is the change in storage. So we can rewrite it in the classical form. And then you see our diagram again showing uh, how it might look like if we were drawing it in this kind of engineering strategy. So just remember though, as we move along here, that latent heat flux in our energy balance qu equation is a way to express ET in terms of energy. If you know latent heat flux, you know ET, right? So all you have to do is divide your latent heat flux by the latent heat of vaporization and that'll give you your mass amount. So, you know, if you're a farmer, if you're a farmer and you want to know evaporation in millimeters per day from your field, you go, hey, what does that have to do with the energy balance? It has everything to do with it because if we know the latent heat flux from the farmer's field over 24 hours, we also know the millimeters of water that was evaporated and how much you might have to add back via irrigation. So uh, always remember that. And I put a little video here um, from Khan Academy that shows how cooling occurs during latent heat of vaporization. And um, you might, if you're interested in that, you can, you can watch that video. So again, the surface energy balance of our fields or forests or soils are strongly impacted by water availability. In, a, in other words, if the system is wet, we get one type of energy balance. If the system is dry, we get something quite different. So in this diagram, you see the center um, vector plot shows kind of a typical wheat field with only very mild water stress. So the main form of energy coming in is net radiation, about equal amounts leave by latent and sensible heat, Le and H, and then just a little bit of soil heat flux. Now, if you move over to the left-hand side, you see a well-irrigated cornfield in the middle of the summer. And now you can see latent heat flux is much larger, and the system's not only gaining energy from net radiation, but also gaining energy from sensible heat flux as well. This is what we call advection. And in this case, the temperature of the surface would be cooler than the temperature of the air. Uh, on the very right-hand side, we see a dry system. Uh, and, this, and in this case, we have a bare soil in late summer. And we can see now in this case, sensible heat is bigger than latent heat flux. So they all have to always balance, right? That upper equation, Rn minus G equals Le plus H has to balance. And water avail availability strongly affects how much goes into latent heat flux and how much goes into sensible heat flux. So what we often see is that as we change the management of a field or we change uh, as climate changes and all these kinds of things, Rn and G um, don't change that much, right? Let's say between... a a well-watered crop and a crop with mild water stress. They'll be very similar. But how much of that energy goes to latent heat flux and sensible heat flux is strongly impacted. Here's an energy balance comparison from a paper that I thought was nice. So we see here um, the energy balance terms along the left and then four different um, treatment areas, including a cropped field, a wetland, a pasture and just a slab of concrete. And if you look at the net radiation there, it's the third row down, you can see the net radiation of the field, wetland and pasture are about the same. But if you look at L, E and H, you see big differences, right? With much higher latent heat flux from the wetland compared to the pasture, for example. Um, and uh, conversely, you see sensible heat flux is less in the wetland and higher in the others. Um, if you look at the concrete, it's the oddball where there's hardly any latent heat flux and it all has to go to H. So here you see how the energy balance is, a, there's kind of an energy balance signature 
for different kinds of land surfaces. Right. And um, that can be very useful. Here's a, a paper that I did with one of my um, graduate students when I was at Kansas State University and working a lot on the Kanza Prairie. And you can see here some pictures on the left. The prairie uh, senesces in the fall and becomes kind of brown. You have this dead standing biomass. The ranchers often burn it with a control burn in the spring, and that causes really rapid lush growth that they graze the cattle on. And, and uh, we studied the, how the, this process of burned versus unburned prairie was affected, uh, how it affected the energy balance of the surface. Um, and you can see, especially on the left-hand side, this is early in the spring, that row there, day 123. And you can see really big differences in latent heat flux between the two treatment areas. After they burned it, of course, they get rid of the mulching effect. It's just kind of really susceptible to evaporation. Uh, so that's the uh, dark squares or the is the burned area and the uh, open circles is the uh, unburned. And you can see again how that the energy is available energy is pretty similar between the two, but um, it really affects how latent heat flux and sensible heat flux are partitioned. And you can see that again in the middle of the season and then at the end of the summer. Uh, and by the end of the summer, the two treatments look the same. There's not much different. So uh, this shows you how management practices affect the surface energy balance. So we've seen here that one of the key things to understand is how vegetation or management or these types of factors influence how latent heat flux or how energy, excuse me, is partitioned between sensible and latent heat flux. And one way that was explored was with a famous paper from 1926 uh, by Bowen. And he defined a new term called Bowen ratio. So here on the left hand side, you see our surface energy balance at the top. And then he defines the Bowen ratio as the ratio between sensible heat and latent heat. It turns out that if you can measure or determine the Bowen ratio that it's possible to solve for latent heat flux in that very bottom equation as the ratio of Rn minus G over 1 plus the Bowen ratio. And that's just algebra. If you substitute uh, the second equation back into the surface energy balance you can solve for Le in that way. And it turns out that the Bowen ratio is defined as follows over on the right hand pane and you can see there that it's basically a temperature gradient divided by a humidity gradient okay so if we look at beta on the far right hand side you see the numerator is the specific heat of air times the temperature difference between two heights measured above the surface divided by the latent heat flux um, and a, a conversion factor and the vapor pressure difference between two heights above the surface. So what this tells us, uh, if you think about it a little bit, if you look at this whole slide, is if we could measure the temperature at two heights above the surface and the humidity at two heights above the surface, and if we knew Rn minus G, we could actually solve the whole energy balance. And this is exactly what Tanner did uh, way back in 1960. And here's another kind of explanation of the Bowen ratio that it, from an article where I thought the author did a good job of explaining it. Um, so I just put that in there for as an extra form of reference. Now, the Bowen ratio, as we've kind of alluded to, can be used to measure the latent heat flux from the field. If we go back, right, we see that if we can measure the Bowen ratio and measure Rn and G with a net radiometer and soil heat flux place, we can solve for latent heat flux. We can solve for ET. So, hey, this doesn't sound too bad, right? A couple of measurements above the surface, uh, and I can and I can get my get my estimate of ET. So, a lot of different people have developed ways to measure the Bowen ratio, and I just posted this one as an example. I think this one's particularly good by Cellier, and. It uses, uh, it basically pumps air from two heights above the surface down to a central instrument and measures the humidity difference that way. It turns out, as you might suspect, that the temperature differences and humidity differences between the two heights above the surface are very small, so it takes very good instrumentation. Here's some more examples. 
of Bowen Ratio Systems, and you can see how they've got these two arms positioned above the crop. Uh, they're only about a meter apart. We know from our previous studies that this, gr these gradients are really small, right? So there might only be, you know, a tenth of a degree difference in temperature between those two heights. Or there might only be a tenth of a kilopascal difference. So it's really, really hard to measure and takes really good instruments. But still, it looks very doable, right? And Tanner was even able to do that with some really um, interesting instrumentation back in 1960. So as instrumentation improved, Bowen ratio became more popular. So here's, I thought I would just show you an example of a Bowen ratio calculation and how it's done and then also explore how good the measurements have to be to make it work. So here's a MATLAB live editor example where we take data collected from the Bowen ratio system above a one meter tall wheat field and we're measuring temperature and humidity at 1.2 and 2.2 meters. And we're gonna call those two heights one and two. And so we're measuring, uh, you can see there are inputs or net radiation and soil heat flux. Those are measured directly. We know the pressure, probably get that from the altitude or elevation. Then we have our two measurements of temperature, our two measurements of relative humidity. You can see the differences are very small. There's only a 0.8 degree Celsius difference in the temperature and um, a very small uh, difference in kilopascal, or uh, relative humidity, excuse me, in percent, 37.89 at one height, 39.14 at another, so, so very small. So part one is to find the Bowen ratio and solve for latent heat flux and the energy balance. And then let's um, show what happens if we overestimate relative humidity by 2% or um, overestimate temperature by, I think I only used a half a degree actually in my calculation. So let's look at how just two really small errors in our measurement might affect the results. So part one is uh, just solving this for the Bowen ratio and the energy balance. So first thing we have to do is convert those relative humidity measurements into a vapor pressure. So that's what I do there. And that then that enables me to solve the Bowen ratio and you can see me doing that. So in this case, the Bowen ratio was 0.4634, okay? So that means the ratio of H over LE is 0.4634. So that means that H is smaller than latent heat flux. So that means there's probably gonna be quite a bit of evaporation from the system. Then I can go ahead and solve for my latent heat flux using that famous Bowen ratio equation, Rn minus G divided by one plus the Bowen ratio. And we saw our latent heat flux was 351 watts per meter squared. That's pretty big. So, you know, our net radiation was what, 580? And 351 of that is going into latent heat flux. We can also go ahead and solve for sensible heat flux just by rearranging the energy balance equation. And you can see there that the sensible heat was 163. So now I have all four energy balance terms, Rn, G, latent heat flux, and sensible heat flux. And they add up to, and, and, and that equation solves for itself. And if you subtract the left hand from the right side or vice versa, you get zero, right? So this is what we call energy balance closure. This is an important concept. And one nice thing about the Bowen ratio is that it forces energy balance closure. So we don't, when we finish these calculations, we don't have any extra or missing energy from the system. So now let's study the effect of a measurement error. So let's just assume there was a, um, actually yeah, I've made it, there's a little typo there. It should be a 2% error in relative humidity. And when I, all I do is call it a 2% error in relative humidity measurement. And you can see when I do all the calculations, it caused a 14.5% overestimate of latent heat flux. That's a pretty big error. You know, a lot of, a lot of uh, sensors only guarantee accuracy to 2 to 3%, even good ones. So, you know, that looks pretty uh, uh, damning in a way that a very small error like that could cause... Um, a very large error in latent heat flux. If we add in a half, another half degree error in um, 
temperature. So now we're going to have a 2% error in relative humidity and a half, only a half degree error in the temperature gradient. Okay, again, a very small error. We redo the calculations. Now our error is up to 29%, almost 30%. Okay. So what this shows you is that it takes very accurate measurements uh, and of, of, uh, to do the Bowen ratio technique. And researchers and uh, scientists over the years have developed very clever ways to make these measurements to eliminate bias. It's not good enough just to put, to mount a good instrument at one height and then a good instrument at the other and subtract the difference between the two. They, there will be a bias effect that's too large. So people have developed robotic arms, for example, that actually move the sensors between the two heights so that the same sensor is measuring both at height one and height two. That eliminates bias. That approach that I described by Cellier where he was pumping the air from two different heights down to the same sensor, right? So basically you have to come up with some way to let the same sensor make the measurements at both heights. And that eliminates the bias and allows you to make very accurate measurements. So um, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, but if you get interested in the Bowen ratio, just remember you've got to deal with that. One of the things that um, also happens with the Bowen ratio is near sunrise and sunset, the Bowen ratio will often approach minus one. And if you look at our latent heat flux equation, Rn minus G divided by one plus the Bowen ratio, if beta starts getting close to minus one, then that, that'll cause um, the, the Le value to explode or get extremely um, large. And that calculation will become numerically unstable. And so what you often see is kind of, um, kind of noisy or bad data from the Bowen ratio around sunrise and sunset. And that has to be corrected and gap filled. And also nighttime data is often not very good because now it's all dependent on the net radiometer and soil heat flux plates. So uh, that's one of the reasons that the Bowen ratio is sometimes uh, not uh, adopted is just because of these difficulties handling the data. And so a lot of people have moved toward other techniques that don't have that drawback. But people still use the Bowen ratio to do very valuable studies. Just here's an example um, from 2020 showing the use of the Bowen ratio was actually used in this study to study the effect of um, a cuticular wax on, on the water use of grain sorghum. And they used the Bowen ratio method to get the energy balance study evapotranspiration, study how the cuticular wax affected the canopy conductance for water vapor. So still can be a very useful technique and it's quite a bit less expensive than other techniques that we'll talk about here in a minute, like eddy covariance or large aperture, uh, large aperture uh, scintillometry. So again, sort of getting towards summary of this is that we have, um, the surface energy balances are strongly affected by water availability, right? So remember that when it's wet, the Bowen ratio is less than one or sometimes can be negative. When it's dry, the Bowen ratio will get very large. You know, if you went out to a desert and took Bowen ratio da data, you know, your Bowen ratio might be 10, for example. So you can use this Bowen ratio as sort of an indicator of um, the status of your system in terms of water availability and water stress. So in summary, the Bowen ratio can be used in two ways. First, regardless of how latent heat flux and H are measured or modeled, evaluating trends in the Bowen ratio can tell us if the energy balance is dominated by latent heat flux or it's water or sensible heat flux convection. And then second, Bowen ratio is a useful way to actually measure ET from crops and vegetation. Uh, over the last 20 years, Bowen ratios method has kind of lost popularity as more advanced methods like eddy covariance and large aperture scintillometers have taken over. But still, it can be a really good, useful tool, you know. And it kind of occurs to me now that we have really low-cost do-it-yourself instrumentation um, like Arduinos, um, Raspberry Pis. We have sensors are a lot cheaper than they used to be. Um, it might be kind of fun to revisit the whole Bowen ratio idea and see if one can build extremely low cost 
uh, system. You know, an eddy covariance system might cost you forty or fifty thousand dollars, right? But what if you could build a way to measure ET for four or five hundred dollars, right? Uh, with the Bowen ratio method. Yeah, it's got some drawbacks, but still, for a lot of people uh, around the world, it could be a pretty handy tool to do research on ET and the energy balance.